through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin. I have a special episode today in honor of searching for Sugar Man. I have the director and the subject of the film. You want to introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Rodriguez. I am an and I'm a musician, uh, born in Detroit. My mother and father both Mexican, San Luis Potosi and San, San Maria de Rio. And, and I'm Malik Benjiru, the director of Searching for Sugarman. And this is Spencer. I am Spencer, yes. Thank you so much. Oh, very, very uh, <laughs> the first question that I, I have to begin with is, mm -hmm. how did this documentary come about? Because it seemed like such an interesting, one of those cases that could have easily been you know, glossed over. It was a really unique story, a very global story, but it was one of those ones that seems like it, it could have been told many, many years before, but how did you guys come about, or how did, I guess, Malik, it, how did you come about making this documentary? And Rodriguez, what was it like for you when he came to you for the documentary? I found this story in 2006 when I was out. I quit my job and I went out traveling for six months in Africa and South America with a camera looking for good stories. And in Cape Town I met Stephen Sugar Seagerman, who is the, mm. the detective mm -hmm. in this film. There is a detective story in this <laughs> story. And, and he told me this and I was like, wow, this is basically this, the best story I ever heard and ever will hear. I, I, it was my profession to find good stories and this was like ten times the best story I ever heard. It was... Uh, a true fairy tale and and with the best soundtrack ever i mean it was a, so beautiful and and for you rodriguez what was it like when he comes to you and is like i want to make a documentary about your story i mean that's got to be kind of a surreal moment well, for you well the approaches were were subtle to that he uh, i met malik benjalul in in 08 you know and the mm. uh, and um my judges had spoken with him before and the thing is that uh, but I was resistant, I was reluctant, I was uh, kind of skeptical about the entire thing. And I, I, I asked him to come in July and in, in, in February, with the two extremes of weather in, in Detroit, and in, in, in <laughs> Chicago, the rest of it, New York, the rest of it. But anyway, I'm urban, as opposed to rural, so anyway, and he took up the challenge of, of and came over and they were filming in the snow and everything, and so, I, I, so anyway, um, and that's how it's inspired it, pretty much. And you, as you said, you know, this is sort of a mystery in a lot of ways. How did you go about sort of uh, telling that story? Because you came to it, I guess, after the mystery had sort of, at least w for the majority of it, concluded. How did you sort of think about structuring it like that? I mean, for for people who are unfamiliar with Rodriguez, it seems like it's a great one. Like, personally, me, I I was unfamiliar with him before seeing the film, so I thought it was a great mystery. I was like, I don't even, I, I don't know what's going on, like, whoa, it's alive, dead, all this sort of stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. How did you sort of go about constructing it in sort of um, a manner that was a mystery as opposed to just being like, here's this dude, this is his life, you know? Right, I mean, uh, yeah, the story is structured so actually you don't know whether Rodriguez is dead or alive for the first 42 minutes. And some people said, you could do that because everyone is going to know I mean, he's actually sitting here. Uh, but then in the end, it, I was thinking that, yeah, but it's, this is the story. I mean, if you, if you see Titanic, you know, the ship is going to sink. But right. it's, the, it's a good story. And, and this story wasn't really like a manipulated or contrived narrative structure. It was just, this is the way it happened mm. from the South African perspective. They, I mean, I don't know if you briefly, the stories that Rodriguez yes. is more famous, uh, still is more famous than the Rolling Stones in South Africa. He made two albums in the early 70s that bombed completely in Yeah, but in yeah, exactly. He's, he's incredibly famous over there, he's, but at the same time he was not famous at all in America, in America. which is this weird paradox. And, and they knew that he was dead, as Jimi Hendrix or Jim Morrison. He was a dead superstar in South Africa for, two, for almost 30 years, that was the case. And then the, there were two detectives who started to find uh, there's a search for the truth on how he died. They, they didn't wonder whether he was dead or alive. They knew he was dead, but how did he die? There were different versions <laughs> on how that had happened. And, and then uh, after years of search, they, they found him in the flesh and well, it's like 
Well, that, that was sort of one of the most amazing things to me was all the rumors about your death. Like that was like, you know, you set yourself on fire, mm -hmm. you shot yourself in the head. How exactly, did you do any sort of looking into how that all began? Because it's sort of funny, you know, with the internet nowadays, I could sort of see, you know, one person goes on Twitter and is like, blah, blah, blah is dead. And it sort of spreads like wildfire. But this is a long time ago, pre-internet. How did you sort of look into how that room, those rumors began or um, yeah, just the mystery, how that mystery began? Yeah, I mean, if you have no information, if you have a guy who is literally as famous as Jimi Hendrix, but... You know, those guys we know. We know how Jim Morrison, he died in a bathtub in Paris. I mean, they, we all have stories about it. every single big artist. You can read it in newspapers or in magazines or in books. But about this guy, they didn't have any information. And then one day, one person, I don't know who, makes up a story that he died in this, you know, he died. And he died in this very special way. And then since no one had a, any, like... No one could say, no, you're wrong. This is what happened. So the, in the end, those myths and mysteries start to develop. And everyone, and in the end, they, they became household stories. Yeah. Everyone knew those stories. And, and for you, Rodriguez, what was it like to be like, did, at what point did you learn about all these like massive rumors about oh. your death like it because it's it's sort of it's i mean they were so elaborate and wild like when it, the opening scene where oh. Seagerman's driving is like and then the, he set himself yeah, on fire yeah, on stage it was like yeah, i was like holy yeah, holy yeah, crap yeah, i was yeah, not yeah, prepared uh, for this well um, in expense an expression of that and reflecting on it after a while you know i was thinking maybe it's something like he went out in a blaze of glory you know that kind of maybe that was stretched out to a, a crazy Point. Right. You know, so maybe like this in the language itself, I think maybe that might contribute to that. But I, I didn't have anything to do with the, uh, the movie in the sense of who he interviewed or sure. who he chose to put this film together and, and that through animation and through. Uh, and he, he uh, Malik Benjelou's film, uh, uh, he, he has a suspense that he creates mm -hmm. and he holds it and he holds it. And it's much like a musical score in, in that it has that crescendo build-up. So it, it has a, a lot of things. And the journalist uh, approach of asking those hard questions and researching and how he highlights the certain uh, aspects of the film and, and brings forth printed words. So I think those kinds of techniques, which are unique to, to the, the film, and um, Melanie Winslow being from Sweden, you know, it, it was... Uh, are the Preminger, uh, mm. uh, you know, uh, uh, and those notables from that area, you know, and so I think Malik Manjuli is following in that kind of history in that uh, other, you know, uh, uh, Ingmar Bergman, you mm -hmm. know, and, and if he's the godfather of Swedish films, and then uh, Malik Manjuli is a is a godson, you know, in that uh, the attention he's garnered, uh, standing ovations. Uh, he won the uh, award in Moscow. He, he's, he's, uh, his film, and out of ten thousand entries to the Sundance, that it he's picked, and that he wins. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's and great. and this thing is two people. I mean, I, I'm sure he a lot of research went into it, and other technical kind of people. But the cinematography there is mm. is, is Cam uh, Camilla and. Uh, her last name, Camilla? Skigerstrom. Yeah, and, and then Malik. So these two uh, group, and then uh, that's minimalistic as you can get it mm -hmm. in, in the night form. Uh, yeah, so I th in the film. And so uh, that saying that, Spencer, that saying that uh, the uh, pen is, mi is mitered in the story, Walter said that. I think today the camera is mitered in the pen because it can capture so much. And uh, look what's in the Middle East there. Uh, the film, the sites we see of Syria and the, that whole Middle East, the Tunisia, a food vendor uh, revolution there, and just ordinary people changing the world, and and uh, so so I think it's a, well, it is a brand new century, you know for sure, and so, uh, but see some of these other things are still about, so uh, it's just hard to, so it's I'm, I describe myself as a musical political, so some of the themes within my songs that Malik Benzler has captured 
Oh, oh, I'm glad that you got so much to perceive it uh, as well. Absolutely. I mean, one it, of the things... It's excited my music career so a lot, so... I mean, that's one of the things that's really interesting is that your songs are do have these political messages that mm-hmm. resonated so strongly with South Africa. And it seems like South Africa seems to be this beacon of music, at, at least it's this true. year. I mean, you had uh, Under African Skies about Paul Simon's mm-hmm. album, Graceland. Yeah. You had uh, Beware of Mr. Baker about mm-hmm. Ginger Baker moving down to there. What is it about the South mm-hmm. African mu- music scene that seems to resonate so strongly with... Well, maybe it's... Well, I don't know what... what but. Uh, it's certainly uh, a new territory, I call it virgin territories, you know, and the thing is, uh, um, and through music and through film now, it's, it seems to, uh, we're getting, uh, more people are becoming aware. Mm-hmm. So, and, so, uh, and so the issues, the apartheid, there was conscription there. They were, these Afrikaans defended their country in Algolia and in, in uh, Namibia, and the thing is, uh, and much in the United States was uh, this, this youth was the young ones were protesting the war, uh, burning the draft cards, going to Canada, and you know when, and so these same things were occurring here as a parallel world, so to speak, too. But now we can view that other side of the mountain, so to speak. One of the um, most interesting mysteries, as you know, you are able to get this massive career in oh, South yeah, Africa. Yes. Uh, but part of the reason I think, I mean, at least from my interpretation of the film, is that it's because the the royalties disappear. You know, you might mm-hmm. been a- have been able to catch on to this growth if the royalties had actually well, gotten to you. But what 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 is your perception they, of that at this if, point? If they had done me right, it's so totally speak. totally. But uh, you, are you guys do you guys see it as sort of like Clarence Avant, as sort of like? Uh, dodging that issue, or what exactly do you think happened to all this money that sh- presu- presumably should have been made during that time? Yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting. I, I didn't want to go too deep into it because the film is, in a way, not about money, but still, it needs to be to because that's the reason totally, Reeves yeah. never knew he was famous. He yeah. didn't get any checks. Normally, you know that you're famous because you get royalties. Oh totally, yeah, and and. Um, and I know, for example, that Rodriguez to this day sells gold in South Africa, and he and he still doesn't get any royalties, and wow. and, and that's a, a, another company that in, it's a very you know it's a very complicated case actually. <laughs> it's a lot of companies involved. Well, it, it, I mean, the, the film is really a very beautifully structured documentary. I want to ask you about you know working with Simon Chin because it seems like that dude is everywhere within the the world of documentary filmmaking. For instance, I just literally watched the documentary The Imposters, which is another sort of fun mystery documentary as well. What was it like working with him and what exactly did he bring to you in terms of working on this documentary? He's great. I mean, he brought a lot of ideas uh, and, and uh, intelligence and, you know, he's a very smart producer. He's one of the greatest producers in, in, the, in the world, I would say. He, he came in into the project quite late. Uh, in in to, in eleven, I've been working for three years before he, he came. Wow. On okay. Yeah. So, and the film was like ninety percent finished. But the last things that he did was absolutely crucial for for mm. finishing the movie. He was. I, I, he's a very good producer. And for you, Rodriguez, one of the things that <laughs> sort of was most interesting to me is you almost seem like a cat in a lot of ways. Like you had nine sort of lives. You had oh, you had you had like right. the musician, yeah, then you were right. like blue collar worker, yeah. you were aspiring you, politician, you like right there. documentary you know, subject. I, like it's left the right there. You're a writer, you know, a cat in life. Well, it's so sort of that's like good. that's what, good analogy. What, yeah. What and is your much, perception uh, of it? Pretty much I've used them all up. <laughs> I've got a little bit of one left. I, I, th- so. I think you have a few left, but <laughs> what, what is no. your sort of perception of no. yourself? I mean, I've, you've said you've done so many different things. Oh, like, wh- what, what exactly do you look back on and say like, oh, that was the best time. Was it the music? Was it, oh, the, you I know, think, going to South Africa? Uh, Spencer, you know the answer to that. It's always now. This is the, <laughs> this is the moment, Spencer. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, it's pretty much that. But, uh, yeah, I... I uh, the experience is that uh, it's never too early to, and never too late, you know, I guess. And uh, the other thing is, he conquers to conquers himself. In regard to the rock and roll mess that, that uh, the Fogarty, John Fogarty has, uh, how about uh, uh, um, the Rolling Stones with Ellen Klein there and, and the, the, the copyrights in that situation and all that. It's, and the naivety of young bloods too. So you hang on to your copyrights and then and I and if you could do good productions, and I think these music uh, productions were good, um, 
it can last for a couple of decades. And maybe for young buds, the way I broke into the Australian market, uh, I got air played by a person named Holger Brockman, this jockey named Holger Brockman, who played me after midnight and and uh, three triple J. And so that's how I broke into that market in Australia, and I had those two tours there. And so maybe that's an approach uh, a, a, a young musician might try is to to get airplay for try it for six months as a as a plan. And and when you turn in the CD and say, could you play this or something to the right person, uh, and ask to, if you can solicit it to him so or her, or, you know, and just indicate which song you want them to hear so that. You can give them focus as well so as a listening thing instead of saying, "Here's my CD, pick one that you like." Or something. This way, you're guiding them into trying to uh, uh, notice your expression or your uh, your song or your composition. You know? yeah. So I think it's and and also that we don't have to worry about the domestic market anymore as much as there's the mm. other the other countries. And well, so too, it's far-reaching. Like this thing can go everywhere. Well, the, you, I mean, one of the most interesting questions about it is, uh, why did it go wrong in the first place? I mean, well, it was, it was, I mean it's a different question there. Uh, you know, and so music, as you know, is is instant rewards. We, you know, we we count up the receipts at night. With films, you have to wait a little while. With painting, you got to put it on the paper. Yeah, the wall. You got to go carry the painting around. Music's an easy form for me, and it's a it's an art form. It's certainly a business and industry. Do you think it was just like a lack of exposure, though, that was oh, really the ultimately? Surface. I don't know those reasons. I only knew the first part of this movie, or the story rather. I knew up to that the the company went bankrupt, and that uh, well, I better do something, uh, make some decisions here, and so I, I didn't know about the royalties, or I, you know, or knew about the countdown or whatever of that. Uh, because I didn't believe the first part I, that I was anything in South Africa, so that that kind of uh, you know, it's yeah, you know what I mean. Well, it's just it's just so interesting because you know there's so much of like this myth about you in the beginning of the film where it's like they're talking about going through these like fog lit oh. streets to go see you oh, perform yeah. well, in a bar and like well, you have your back turned like they, it's, it's sort of like how much of that well, like wait myth a versus they try can you get any <laughs> city. If you don't know the area, it can be, get a little gruesome at night. Uh, it's, uh, oh, it's, it's, it's so poetic. The, the weather changes, you know, and so <laughs> forth. But it's like Seattle, you know, I, I think it has many, many, many oh, you're abs- bases you're, of... You're um, absolutely right. Uh, yeah, well, I've, yeah, there's different descriptions, and so do all the other... <laughs> but do you, do you remember it similarly, or do you just remember, like, being in a bar playing and two dudes came up to you and like, we want to do your album? Because they, 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 well, in the beginning of the film, they're like, although, oh, yeah, we came in there at night, they, and... <laughs> Although they say that as you age, that your <laughs> senses diminish, I kind of think maybe they get even sharper in some cases. And certainly, I, I'm a little klutzy now, but uh, I, I do. I think that uh, that um, I well, I want to say I remember every second. You know, <laughs> um, the film is wonderful. And um, wh- where can people find out more information about it? And where is it going to be? You know, seen. It's going to be here in Seattle, on August 10. Fantastic. And uh, website cinemas. or anything? And there's, yeah, searchingforsugarman.com, and, and there is a soundtrack coming out also, yes, before, so the, the best songs. And we're going to do the David Letterman show wow. August the 13th. And uh, um, and they're saying they, they want to do that set with uh, violins, you know. Wow. It's much like we said about <laughs> it. But the thing is that, and should I play with my a band that I create, or should uh-huh. I? Play with the studio band, so right, all right. these. But what an exciting time! Yeah, no, that's amazing. So, but uh, but this has been a pleasure, well, Spencer. Absolutely, a lot for thank you guys so time. much uh, for joining me in. And really, yeah. uh, check you. out the film absolutely, and uh, check out more interviews at MacGuffinPodcast.com. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can't stop me, I'm a fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me, I'm a fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm a fire tonight. It's tight, don't even try to buy the sound style. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm a fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm a fire tonight. The board can't